please uh, take your seats. We starting the session number two on emerging markets. And we have also one important update for the program. Uh, tomorrow we start a uh, little earlier. At 8.30 we will have the presentation of the book uh, Reforming Global Economic Governance and Unsettled Order from uh, Carlo Monticelli, the Vice Governor of the Council of Europe Development Bank. Уважаемые дамы и господа, мы начинаем сессию номер два. У нас маленькое объявление для вас. Мы завтра мы... We have some announcement. Tomorrow we'll start early at 8.30. We'll be introducing the book Reforming of Global Economic Governance. The author of which is Carlo Monticelli, one of our speakers, deputy chairman of the uh, uh, Council of the European Banker. Massimo, the floor is yours. I've been put under time pressure, so I will, uh, I will, I, I will have to be speedy. Uh, first of all, allow me to introduce myself. My name is uh, Max Castelli. I am the head of strategy for Sovereign Institution at UBS uh, Asset Management. And actually, I had the pleasure of attending the last few years of the Astana Economy Forum. So it's always a pleasure to be here and discuss the latest trends in the global economy. I mean, you heard already a lot about, in the first panel, about uh, what are uh, the major trends, in particular protectionism in the world, which of course shaping the global economy. But of course, uh, we would like to move one step ahead and shift the focus in particular, not on the sort of promoter of trade war, if you want, which is the, one of the developed economy, the largest one in the world, but actually to talk about how emerging markets are adapting to this, uh, to these new trends. And uh, I have actually a very distinguished panel which uh, represents different uh, industries and also different parts of the world. I think this will make the debate even more interesting. And uh, if I follow the order here, I have uh, Jose Antonio Campo, who is a member of the Board of Central Bank uh, in uh, Colombia and also former Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. We actually met just a few weeks ago in uh, Washington, D.C. in a very interesting conversation. We have uh, Yaroslav Lisovolik, Senior Managing Director and Head of Research at Sberbank, Investing in Research. Makes me happy, so I'm not the only banker in the panel. And uh, we have uh, Chatib Bastri, Director, Mandri Institute, former Minister of Finance in Indonesia. And uh, last but not least, Pandit Nija Tawarn, uh, apology for my pronunciation if I get it wrong, who is the Chairman of the Foundation for Public Policy and Good Governance and former deputy government of the Bank of Thailand. So, he, emerging markets. So, let me, let me talk, I would like to do this panel in the following way, to ask three fundamental questions to our panelists, and then open the floor for, uh, for a debate between us and, of course, the audience, and I hope that you will raise your hands and ask some questions. So, the first uh, point I would like to make, the first question is that, of course, we talk about protectionism, this is not the only trend which is shaping the global agenda. We have, of course, an uh, over-important issue which impact emerging market. Just to mention a few, of course, uh, monetary policy normalization in the US or eventual monetary policy normalization in the world. Of course, uh, what happened to the dollar as a result of that. These are uh, all, uh, f all factors which matter a lot for emerging market. I think it is also very important, and of course, uh, let me add one comment on each question, is that Actually, emerging markets so far, and if I take uh, the last decade and the post-financial crisis uh, uh, world, actually have been pretty resilient in terms of their ability to navigate through the big change. And uh, actually, as we speak over the last decade, the emerging market accounted for the bulk of global growth. And actually, if you look at, for instance, the simple the IMF latest forecast, emerging markets are expected to continue providing the bulk of global growth going forward. So the question is more about resilience rather than eventual emerging market uh, decelerating uh, dramatically. The, the second question uh, is that, uh, of course, uh, the resilience of emerging market over the last decade did not come, uh, it was not a free lunch. I would say that the rise in debt in emerging market has probably been uh, a sort of a cost that emerging market had to pay in order to alleviate the problem mainly occurring in the western part of the world. So the second question I would like to ask uh, the panelists is, is this risk concrete? How important is the risk for emerging markets? 
and also, of course, for the global economy as a whole. As we know in the past, debt crisis can have uh, knock-on effect, not only in the country and in the region where the, the country is, but also on the global economy as a whole. That's the second question, so more on the risk side. And the third one is a little bit, uh, the one actually that I'm more uh, interested about and, more, and I find it more intriguing, is that uh, like any other economy in the world, developed or uh, emerging, emerging markets are exposed to some important disruptive trends. And just to mention, we talk about protectionism, we could talk about nationalism, anti-immigration, but also important other trends like digitization, artificial intelligence, and let me also add the climate change is an important challenge for everybody. The question is, uh, I would like to ask uh, to the panelists, is uh, to what extent um, emerging markets are uh, uh, capable of navigating these disruptive trends and eventually transform these threats into opportunities, as actually we are seeing in, uh, in some important countries. Classical example is uh, China and technology becoming actually a a challenger to the US despite the, the sharp difference in income per head. So without further ado, I will ask to my panelists to tackle these three questions in, uh, in the order as we are sitting, and then we open for debate. So Jose, you are the first just because you're sitting this, just after me. Okay, well, thank you very much. I am extremely glad to be uh, here today uh, in this uh, very important conference. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the three questions that you have asked uh, uh, have, a, let's say, also short-term and long-term dimension. Uh, so l let, me, uh, 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 let me perhaps clarify that I come from a part of the world that has not been very dynamic in terms of economic growth. Uh, I mean, Latin America uh, over the past five years uh, has grown less than 1% per year. Uh, so it's uh, actually a non-dynamic region. So we are not contributors to world economic growth. And, and some of the countries are in major crisis, uh, Brazil being the most important. But for example, the other large economy of Latin America, Mexico, uh, grows like 2.5% per, per year on, on average, which is very slow rate of growth by, let's say, by Asian standards. I mean, the, the issue of dynamics of the emerging world uh, leading the dynamics of the world economy uh, is really a nation phenomenon. Or you can see, if, uh, you know, East and South Asia now, with uh, India, of course, being a very important actor. Okay. Now, let me perhaps uh, start, you know, in, um, among the challenges, uh, mentioning uh, some issues of the trade wars. Uh, uh, one that actually I didn't see uh, in the previous panel, uh, which I wanted to underscore, which is the trade deviation that is being generated by, by the different uh, policy measures. Uh, let's say there are opportunities for some countries uh, and there are costs. For example, in terms of opportunities, just to mention one, uh, uh, for example, Brazil has benefited greatly from the restrictions uh, by China on imports of soybeans. Uh, <laughs> uh, the soybean industry in the U.S. is actually in crisis, uh, while the soybean of, uh, industry of Brazil has been booming. Uh, although, you know, with some, you know, initial, uh, recent problem. Now, on the other hand, uh, there are also uh, goods uh, that get, in a sense, you can say even close to dump uh, because of that. For example, it's steel from China getting into Latin America at very low prices. So the trade deviation phenomenon, which nobody has clar quantified clearly, is probably one of the worst dimensions uh, of the trade war. And the other dimension, uh, which links to your first two questions, uh, is the, the financial dimensions. Uh, the fact that because of the trade wars, uh, the uh, financial world uh, has been, become more unsettled, uh, and, uh, uh, and significantly so uh, by recent standards. I mean, what happened Monday, for example, when, when the China retaliated against the U.S., uh, uh, you know, it, it was a major disruption in, in that particular day. But we have had already two weeks of disturbance uh, in global financial markets. And it is quite clear that when there is disturbance in financial markets, it is emerging economies that suffer, uh, in particular, uh, uh, because of the uh, associated risk factor. So those are two issues that relate to the trade that I wanted to underscore. Now, 
On the other hand, the, the issues that, uh, that you mentioned have some, uh, uh, you can say, uh, a positive uh, dimension that I wanted to underscore, uh, which is the fact that uh, probably because of the non-normalization of monetary policy uh, in, the, in the developed countries, uh, emerging economies have had uh, quite a significant access to finance over the past decade, uh, which has been a, a let's say, positive for emerging economies. And I, you see that even in the disturbances that, that we see, the magnitude of the instability or the, or, or the risk that has been uh, generated uh, is less than in the past. Uh, and you see that in, uh, in two, uh, for example, in two dimensions, in the magnitudes uh, as well as in the cost or the, let's say, the spreads uh, in, uh, of bond issues, for example. Uh, in, uh, for emerging economies. In, in terms of, of magnitude of, of, of finance, uh, for example, let me take uh, just a Latin American data. During the debt crisis of the 1980s, we transferred net of, you know, we made a net transfer of resources or around 6% of GDP, of Latin American GDP. During the East Asian crisis, about 3%, much less. And in the recent crisis, it's only about 1%. So the, the, uh, the volatility uh, is much less. Now, that is, of course, associated to the non-normalization of monetary policy. But given the current conditions, I see no normalization coming uh, in the future. So, so that will continue to be a, a positive factor. Uh, uh, now, what that means, uh, 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 or, or another explanation of that, uh, which relates to the question of debt, uh, is, is another dimension, which is uh, foreign exchange reserves. Foreign exchange reserves uh, uh, were si significantly increased since the early 21st century, uh, and, uh, and they, bec they have become a source of uh, strength uh, for many emerging economies. Let's, say if, let, let's take Brazil, for example. Brazil, uh, which has massive foreign exchange reserves, I mean, the by far the largest in Latin America, uh, has had that as a source of defense uh, in, the, in the face of the worst recession it has experienced uh, in recent times. So one particular implication of this is that the, uh, or dimension of this, is that when uh, the countries that are facing, uh, you know, a, a exclusion from financial markets or a strong instability from financial markets uh, are, are a few, uh, are much, uh, is, there is much less contagion uh, than uh, we saw in previous crises. Uh, so let's say in uh, Latin America has been Argentina, uh, uh, we, and then we have Turkey. Uh, and, and they to a lesser extent, you can say uh, perhaps, uh, but much lesser extent, South Africa or Russia, let's say. But in Latin America, it's Argentina. But the Argentinian uh, 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 turbulence in, uh, in terms of access to finance has really generated no lat contagion in Latin America, not even to Brazil. Uh, uh, which is the, uh, the next country. So, so, so the financial issue has a mixed story of, uh, of uh, relatively success. I'm actually more uh, uh, threatened. I think the greatest threat is, is trade. Uh, actually, all the disturbances associated to international trade. Now, you, your last question, perhaps uh, I should uh, uh, give some ideas in, my next, in the next round because of timing. Uh, but, uh, but let me say that the, uh, the, the most important issue uh, when you think about the, uh, uh, surpassing the middle income trap, uh, which was the original question, uh, is really uh, a, a, a investment in science and technology. And, and, the, and what China has done uh, is quite impressive because China beca became uh, you know, a, a country that invests in science and technology uh, almost uh, the same as the average for OECD countries. And this happened in the question of 15 years. Now, in Latin America, we have certainly not done the same. So, uh, so, the, the, so the numbers are, in OECD is about 2.4% of GDP in investment in science and technology. Latin America is 0.7%. China is a bit more than 2%. Uh, so, the, uh, so if countries lag behind in investment in science and technology in this era of a technological revolution, or fourth industrial revolution, as it, as it has come to be called, uh, I think the costs uh, are extremely uh, strong uh, in terms of uh, potentialities of growth. But there are other 
you know, positive things that can happen. For example, the issue of climate change, but I'll, I'll refer to that later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move to Jaroslav. Thank you very much. It's, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to deliver my views on uh, the questions that you outlined, and I think uh, they are very much, um, I think, topical in terms of the challenges that we're seeing uh, currently, both, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, short-term-wise, I, I think clearly short-term-wise, uh, the challenges revolve around uh, protectionism and trade wars. Uh, longer term, uh, it is about uh, how uh, a rising number of developing nations get out of the middle income trap because indeed if we look at the figures um, there are only very few occasions when uh, countries were indeed capable of overcoming the gravity of, uh, of the middle uh, income trap. So to start on the, uh, the first challenge, the first question of trade wars, uh, I think, uh, as, uh, as in many such occasions, you can say it's a challenge, but also an opportunity of sorts. Uh, it's clearly a challenge because uh, it's uh, a major question mark with regard to the sustainability of economic growth in the global economy. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to some degree because uh, developing nations can uh, pay more attention to building their platforms of economic integration along the south-south axis. And in fact, uh, this is precisely what we're seeing. I think uh, this trend is not uh, well documented, so to say, and not uh, commented on as much. But if you look at the developments of last year, uh, indeed, uh, what we saw was uh, the formation of several uh, very important uh, projects in terms of economic, regional economic integration. We can talk about the uh, free trade area in Africa uh, that the countries uh, on the continent launched uh, last year and hopefully that will uh, bring uh, uh, fruits in terms of uh, greater economic openness there. In Latin America, we're seeing signs that uh, of course, there are regional challenges there as well, um, uh, but uh, there are also discussions that were launched last year between Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance on possible cooperation, and if that progresses further, then we're talking about uh, an almost continent-wide alliance that could form there. And uh, in uh, the Eurasian uh, continent, uh, what we're seeing is also uh, the crystallization of other uh, integration uh, projects, uh, including the, uh, with regard to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, India joining uh, that alliance. Um, uh, there are other initiatives like, for example, BRICS Plus that China came up with in 2017. So uh, clearly there's uh, a lot of um, uh, thinking and a lot of dynamism that we're seeing in that part of the global economy. And this, if uh, it uh, does continue, that could be a force, I mean regional integration performed by developing economies, by emerging markets, that could be a force that could neutralize to some degree the negative effects of the protectionism uh, that we're seeing uh, elsewhere. In terms of other responses that uh, developing countries could come up with uh, in dealing with uh, protectionism, I think uh, with regard to macroeconomic policy, it's greater reliance on economic policy rules versus discretion. So greater predictability being one of the byproducts of that kind of macroeconomic policy setup. Together with protectionism, what we have as a result is greater uncertainty. So I, I think having policy anchors, economic policy rules is important in that regard. And then um, I think uh, for a lot of the developing uh, economies and emerging markets, uh, the diversification of the economy is a major um, issue, a major a need, uh, because as you see the intensity of external shocks with regard to emerging markets rising, uh, including vis-a-vis -vis, uh, trade wars and uh, protectionism, 
what you need is a more diversified setup in terms of uh, sexual development. What China is doing, I think, is uh, pretty important in that respect because we're starting to see more of a contribution coming from the consumer, coming from the services sector there. With regard to Russia, with regard to Kazakhstan, clearly the, the key issue is diversification away from oil and gas. So those are the three priorities, I think, with regard to protectionism. Very briefly on the remaining two questions, uh, with regard to debt, I think uh, it's not just about the quantity of debt that is rising indeed uh, in the global economy, and that is a, is a major challenge, but also there's the, the issue of quality in the sense that um, uh, it's also about contingency liabilities that are not uh, well documented and that could come up as a surprise um, if um, the uh, statistics and if, the, uh, uh, if accounting for these contingent liabilities is not as, uh, as uh, efficient. Um, I think another issue is this combination of higher interest rates and growth slowdown. If this is the paradigm that we're seeing in the next several years, then this is a double whammy with regard to um, this whole issue of uh, the debt load for emerging markets. And finally, uh, currency mismatches. Um, uh, th that's another challenge for emerging markets, and uh, if that is the case, one interesting paradigm is the use of national currencies by uh, emerging markets and mutual settlements. We're seeing a lot of emphasis placed on this by countries of the Eurasian Economic Union, by Russia, by Kazakhstan. So this is something that I think, uh, you know, de-dollarization through using uh, national currencies. And finally, on, on the, the last question with regard to the middle income uh, trap, there is no silver bullet. Um, certainly, uh, the um, uh, fourth in, uh, industrial revolution, AI, all of this is, is important, uh, is necessary for countries not to lag behind, uh, but I think there's a broader problem of the trap not being only with regard to individual countries, but for the global economy as a whole as well. So that means that countries need to be open uh, in surmounting this middle income trap. Uh, and this is also a necessity for overcoming the larger trap that the global economy is facing uh, globally. That means openness. And if you look at the very few economies that have overcome the gravity of the middle income trap, this, uh, for example, would be, you can say, South Korea. Um, and in that case, I think one very important feature of the success of this economy is precisely the openness of this economy and the multiple alliances that it has forged across the global economy in terms of FTAs, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me move to Chatib, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to thank for having me in this uh, very prestigious event. Let me perhaps speak from the perspective of Southeast Asia, because uh, nowadays uh, Southeast Asia region perhaps is the region with the fastest growing economy in the world. We still grow by about more than 5%, and if you include uh, East Asia, we grow by more than 6%. So the potential is really there. And if you look at the success story, the history of the success story of the Southeast Asia are basically two recipes. The first one was industrialization. The second one was openness of trade. But now the question is, could we repeat the similar story under the illiberal times now? Yeah, I think this is very important. And let me talk from the policy perspective. If you look at from the several options of doing reform, I do believe that all policymakers know what to do. Let me quote what Jean-Claude Juncker said, we all know what to do, but we just don't know how to get re-elected after we've done it. And I think he's right. So we have to include the political economy story on this process. Let me give an example. If we try to continue with the reform by doing this unilateral reform, I think the situation is rather difficult now in many emerging markets because the tendency of this rising protectionism, etc. 
If you want to go to the multilateralism, even though I completely agree and support what Montex said in the previous session, that we need to go for this WTO, pursue for the WTO, but it will take some time. So the option available at the given that constraint is how to continue to reform at the given constraints. And to me, the most important one is because you know the merit of the reform is not about what kind of reform that we are going to launch, but the political support. And the problem with the reform is the cost is immediate, but the benefit is always in the medium term. So we need to find something in the short term. So my suggestion is perhaps when we are talking about this openness for the trade regime, foreign direct investment, we need to include the issue of the social protection, the inclusiveness, financial inclusion. Without that, nowadays will be very difficult to continue with the reform because politicians will not get support from their own constituent. And I think this is the thing that, you know, something, some elements that perhaps we didn't have in the 90s when we open up a sort of like trade regime, the FDI, etc. That's on this, you know, the issue of this, what kind of reform. Of course, you can talk about the, you know, a very typical of reform, open up the trade regime, the FDI, uh, streamlining the regulation, but need to be supported or supplemented by this issue of this inclusiveness. The second issue uh, about this volatility, the financial uh, situation, the debt issue. Some emerging markets, including Indonesia, are trapped in the situation to choose between stability and growth. I was a finance minister when I had to deal with the issue of taper tantrum at the time, was 2013. Because the Fed decided to unwind the quantitative easing, then we at the emerging market, we had to manage the situation of the, you know, of this uh, capital outflow. The question is, is a running a current account deficit more than 3% is a sin? And I don't think so, because in the early stages of development, many emerging markets still needs to import a lot of capital goods and raw materials. But nowadays, if you run a current account deficit more than 3%, you'll be punished by the market. So the question is, we are trapped in the situation whether we maintain the stability of the exchange rate, the financial sector, or we need to sort of like, you know, uh, to pursue with the growth. The solution for this is again, in my view, is sort of like to look at the issue is not on the current account, but more on the capital account side. As long as it is financed by the FDI, but they should be fine. But again, the question is back to the political economy issue, whether we could sort of like accept that kind of things. So again, without a sort of like a strong political support, that will be a very difficult, you know, sort of like to, to maintain the stability of this macro and also at the same time to pursue the economic growth. On the debt issue, luckily, you know, some of the Southeast Asian countries we are quite a sort of like conservative in, in terms of the fiscal balance. Let me give an example about Indonesia. We apply the fiscal rules since 2003, in which if the fiscal deficit to GDP go beyond the 3%, the president could be impeached. That's the beauty to become a finance minister in Indonesia, because you can tell the politician, I would love to support your idea, but this is the rule. We, we adopted the, the Maastricht rule, which is interestingly, none of the European countries adopted that, that kind of model. So because of that, we are able to reduce the debt to GDP from more than 100% to become less than 30% nowadays. So on that, that issue, I think we are doing relatively okay. Last but not least, your third question about this middle income trap. I can see the potential risk of some emerging markets, especially in Southeast Asia, to grow old without becoming rich, unless we could expedite the economic growth. And in order to push the economic growth, in my view, we need several things. The first one is to put emphasis on the quality of the human capital. Yeah. But the question is, what kind of model that we can adopt? Many emerging markets allocate a lot of funding for education, but not much in improvement because the problem is because the limitation of the curriculum. In my view, perhaps we could ask the private sector to help us with vocational training 
and give a tax deduction if they are doing that. On the health issue, we need to allocate more funding on the, on the health issue. This is a very important one. In addition to that, of course, this needs to be supported by the good infrastructure. Now the question is, what is the role of this technology? I think this is a very important, in my view, the disruption what is happening now is not a job replacement, but the redefinition of job. Because as long as we can retrain people, then we could sort of like handle this issue. But the biggest problem now is how the government should position themselves. I can imagine the government will be in a very difficult situation nowadays because every time they issue a decree, the next day will be obsolete because the product cycle is getting shorter and shorter. The solution for this is we need an agile bureaucracy. But agile bureaucracy is an oxymoron. There is no way that bureaucracy can be agile. Yeah. So this is the thing that we probably need to anticipate in the future. Yeah. To in, in the issue of the disruption, what is the role of the government? Last but not least, I think the most important one to escape the uh, middle income trap is the issue of this governance. Because I do believe that the future you know, uh, incentive for the investor to come to emerging market is no longer a physical capital asset, but the quality of policy. But the problem, let me talk from the Indonesian perspective, we have a lot of problem with the issue of governance. Corruption, you know, is doing business. I'm jokingly said to my colleague in Indonesia, one of the reasons of why many Indonesians become religious is because they have to deal with the government. And I think this is very true in the sense that we have to streamline the regulation. We have to come up with a good institution in order to avoid this uh, middle income trap. I think I leave it up here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I move to Bandit for our last introductory remark. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First, let me say thank you for the invitation. This is my first trip to Astana, so I was very pleased to be here. Uh, let me just begin by saying that I think we are living in a very difficult and highly unpredictable world at this time. You know, the objective of emerging market has always been how to keep growing you know, without running the risk of facing a financial crisis, right? Or growing then, you know, accumulating so much vulnerability that it eventually leads to a financial crisis. This always has been, you know, the, the, the desire. But I think this objective has been made more and more difficult, especially at this time, you know, when we have so many uh, policy uncertainties and so many uh, volatility in the financial markets. Last session, we spoke about the, uh, the, 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 the trade war, okay? If you remember uh, the second quarter of last year, we had a financial turmoil in many emerging markets. And one of the key factors that prompted that disruption was the concern about the global trade conditions, as well as the rising trend of U.S. interest rate and also the strengthening of the U.S. dollar. All this prompted, you know, a concern about e emerging markets and led to, you know, capital outflow, currency weakening, and so on. I think the situation has returned to normal now, but it reminds us of how difficult to navigate you know, the continued growth and stability of emerging market in this context where global financial markets is huge and that it can change the way it looks at the situation all the time. So I think these are the, the key risks of how to navigate the success of our growth you know, in the context of, of avoiding mishap and also financial vulnerabilities. Now going back to the uh, three questions that has been raised, I think on the first one about how to manage all these uh, different shocks and volatility, one lesson that we learned, I think uh, Mr. Wills all agree from the Asian financial crisis was that, was the importance of reform, okay? If you can enact a reform that can help to build, you know, or strengthen your growth fundamental and also build you, uh, your resilience against shock, 
that would go a long way you know, in, in helping you to cope with the disruption in the global economy. In the case of the ASEAN countries, you know, we have embarked on maybe three or four key areas of reform. First, on the monetary policy framework that includes, you know, that enhances flexibility and policy discipline. The second, on the financial sector, to improve risk management, to improve uh, resilience and also to improve banking supervision and regulation. But the third front, many people might not mention, is to promote greater integration within the region in terms of trade and investment and also in the context of building a common facility to manage the risk of crisis in the sense of setting up the organization called CMIM and AMRO, you know, to look after uh, market surveillance and also crisis protection. I think all these key things have been, has been useful you know, to helping emerging market Asia to continue to perform. But so far, you know, we are looking at the situation whereby how to leverage on this success forward in light of the increased difficulties in the world economy. The second issue is on the debt. My take is that the lesson that we've learned from the Asian financial crisis and also from the global financial crisis of 2008 is that crisis is all about debt, okay? Excessive indebtedness usually leads to financial vulnerabilities. And when the confidence of the market changes about your ability to grow and to pay back the debt, problem comes, okay? So in this context, at this time, you know, I look at a number. Emerging markets debt is perhaps at its peak at the moment something like 63 trillion at the end of 2017. So uh, against the fact that the world economy is slowing and the fact that you know, the growth will be slowing, which will affect your capacity you know, to earn foreign change to pay debt. I think my, my thought on this subject, on this topic would be that it would be best to try to deleverage at this time, okay? And at the same time, try to restructure you know, the, the, the debt in the countries. The thing that worked very well in Asia was two things. First, developing the local bond market, okay? To shift from foreign currency debt into domestic debt. And second is to reduce the currency mismatch by developing the hedging market for foreign currencies. And the last one, of course, to shorten the maturities of, of, of the debt, to, to, to lengthen the maturity of the debt. So I think at this time, my advice would be, you know, go forward, you know, be, be careful about debt and then take the time to deleverage and also to improve the structure of, of, of the indebtedness through this sort of reform. Now the last point on the moving into the, uh, into, into the next level of development. I think this is the hardest question in economics, right? Some countries can do it, some countries cannot do it. So what's the difference? Why countries uh, you know, were stuck in this you know, for a long time and a few countries managed to do it? I think in the context of this globalized market, we cannot compete one on one basis to be the first to get there. I think in the, in, in the context of a globalized market, I think connectivity is key. We heard this morning by the uh, president that connectivity increases opportunity and it also diversifies risk, okay? So for me, one way to do it is to strengthen economic integration in the region as a way of moving forward together as a group. My, uh, some of you might not know that after the uh, 2008 crisis, the key driver for growth of countries in ASEAN, including Indonesia and Thailand, has been the growth of intra-regional trade. When the world economy was slowing, world trade growth was slowing, ASEAN growth you know, were, were kept at a good pace because of the growth in intra-regional trade. So this showed the benefit of closer integration of countries. And to move forward, I see the scope for deepening this sort of in integration in at least three or four ways. The first one is on the issues of technology. We can embark on a common platform, digital platform, that can benefit everybody in, in the region both the government sector and the private sector. Just one big investment. Think of national identity, right? 
Think of the common processes in customs around the region. Think of you know, small the improvement that, that you can make on the way the government works. This sort of thing will help to reduce costs and increase the speed of, of business transaction because of the common digital platform that is available uh, throughout the region. The second issue would be on infrastructure. I think many people have mentioned this. But my take would be that it would, should be a joint effort that fit with each country requirement, okay? Ra rather than being a grand scheme that, that, that people feel a little bit not related to, to it. And the third one has already been mentioned is the issues of governance. To have a common best practices in the region that sort of a put a new standards of doing business in, in, in the region. It would help to minimize the risk of best practice of, of corruption because all companies in the region would be doing it, okay? So I think, you know, to help to move forward in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, beating this uh, middle income trap under this globalized context, I don't think individual countries should try to compete who to get that first, but we can use the leverage on the collective effort of technologies, governance, and also the issue of infrastructure to help us to, to, to do that job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all this. A lot of, uh, a lot of meat on the fire we, we put in this introductory remarks. So let me go deeper now on the three topics. Because one, uh, on the first question of trade war, I hear that, uh, of course, uh, and we also heard it a lot in the previous panel, that ultimately protectionism and trade war is bad for everybody. It's a negative uh, sum game, everybody lose. But there is also the other side of the coin, which also came out from the discussion. It could also be an incentive, could also be a driver for regional integration. And uh, we are in the Eurasia is an example, but we could talk about the intra-regional trade in Asia, which is rising much faster than with, in, with the trade with the rest of the world. And uh, is this enough uh, to compensate for uh, a U.S. or, generally speaking, a developed world which has become, um, which is more protectionist? First question. And the second one, uh, which I also pick up from the introduction remarks, is short-term versus long-term. This is crucial. It sounds like U.S. and Western economies, also because of the political system, make many choices based on short-term political gains. In order to be re-elected, it's better to be protectionist nowadays or pay more. But long-term, this might not be good. And instead, the emerging market economy tend to have a more long-term strategy. What's your view of this? Can, can emerging market compensate for the more protectionist world by creating the regional platform which ultimately will help to maintain the growth rate which has been able to maintain over the last few years? And maybe we can follow the same order, but a little bit faster than before so that we can tackle the other two issues as well. Well, I, I totally agree with the comments on regional integration. Uh, uh, now, uh, Latin America was the leader in regional integration in the, in the emerging uh, or the developing world, let's say. Uh, actually, our regional integration process go back to 1960. They were, uh, in a sense, copied from the, uh, the uh, uh, creation of the European Economic Community. Uh, uh, but they, but let's be straight, they have been a significant source of frustration. Uh, you know, all, I mean, our major processes gone, have gone through a major crisis. We have not been able to develop what Europe has developed, uh, which is a regional integration, a trade, a, a, well, trade uh, that is uh, resilient to changes in politics in the individual countries, uh, which is what Europe has built. Uh, we have not. So the, the political uh, turbulence, let's say, in several countries uh, have led to, uh, to the crisis of, uh, of regional integration process. Now, the uh, Pacific Alliance is the most recent uh, uh, dynamic process, let's say, uh, going on in Latin America. Uh, it may, you know, partly succeed if Mercosur joins, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be a, a, a success story. Now, uh, we, we have to see. I mean, the, so far the Pacific Alliance is working well. Let's say as the most dynamic process today. Now, would that replace, according to your question, the, um, uh, 
the mess that, that the trade war may generate, I certainly say no way. Um, the real integration is very good for so, some things. For example, in Latin America, the major, uh, uh, for most countries, you know, Mexico is the exception, uh, intra-regional trade is the major source of trade in manufacturers. Uh, uh, while, you know, to the rest of the world, we basically export uh, commodities. And that's certainly true in uh, our relations with China, which have been by far the most dynamic element of Latin American uh, trade in the last uh, 15 years, let's say. Um, so, the, uh, 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 but of course, the U.S. is a major market uh, for Latin America, so, so it's, it's very difficult to think of that it will be a substitution, and, and probably, again, I will point out again that the, the trade diversion, uh, or, uh, uh, which is trade distortions, uh, that the, the uh, trade wars can generate are really uh, a very massive problem. Trade inefficiency, yeah. absolutely. Jaroslav? Yes. Well, you, you already uh, pinned. We understand how, what your thoughts yes, are. Yes, no, I, I, I do realize we have a sequence here. Um, so on the uh, question whether uh, regionalism is going to be, this regional integration is going to be sufficiently strong to compensate for what we're seeing uh, coming out of the U.S., um, uh, I'm not so sure, but uh, if you look at the potential of South-South integration that has not progressed as much in the preceding decades, um, and if you look at the tremendous scope for forging new types of alliances, new kinds of platforms, new formats that are now discussed amongst the developing nations, this could be a very important source of, of a different paradigm towards greater openness in, uh, in the global economy. I mean, first of all, as has been already mentioned by, by other speakers here in the panel, uh, growth performance uh, across emerging markets is, th this is the bulk of growth, the, 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 the developing nations, right? So uh, for developing economies, it makes sense to open up to each other because these are the fast-growing markets. But the, the paradox is that currently, if you look at the trade policies, uh, a lot of the developing nations have uh, very high, uh, at times very high, import tariffs. So apart from the issue of the growth advantage that can be exploited through South-South cooperation, you also have a very substantial degree of trade liberalization because of the relatively high import duties that you, you observe in these countries. And uh, if you look at the average weighted import tariff for developed economies, this is around 3% plus, plus minus. If you look at developing nations, this is several times higher, at times in the, well in the double digits. So, so I think this, this is a very important reserve that needs to be exploited, um, but uh, in answering this question, you also have to be mindful of the fact that regionalism as economic integration, as an instrument of forging greater economic openness is a double-edged sword. It may promote greater openness, but at times it may also be a certain barrier vis-a-vis -vis other countries, vis-a-vis -vis other regional groups as well, right? So uh, that uh, in itself means that uh, you cannot rely solely on regionalism to overcome the current predicament of the world economy. You need something also happening at the level of global institutions and that's where uh, innovation has to take place as well, I think. We need new uh, ways of how global institutions like the WTO operate. Uh, I think one very important line of trying to strengthen the WTO could be to strengthen its mandate uh, with regard to working with regionalism, with regional integration groups. Currently, this, this mandate is there, but it's not being used and is, is very weak in terms of how this coordination, horizontal coordination, you could say, between regional integration groups and uh, the WTO is, uh, is taking place. I think 
we need more innovation there along these lines with regard to short-term versus long-term. Again, uh, I think one of the solutions here is greater predictability in terms of economic policy. The greater this predictability, stability, the, the more, uh, the longer term are the horizons, uh, investment horizons, economic horizons. And I think um, uh, the benefits of policy rules have been amply demonstrated here in, um, uh, in Kazakhstan uh, in terms of dealing with um, uh, oil prices and the ex excess uh, oil revenues that are then concentrated in the, in the oil fund. And uh, another example is Russia, of course, where the use of the budget rule uh, has tremendously reduced uh, the volatility in the ruble and the national currency in terms of its sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, oil prices. So I think this, this line is very important vis-a-vis -vis other emerging markets. Shakib? I think I agree with Minister Ocampo that uh, regional integration cannot entirely replace this multilateral because uh, let me give an example about the case of Asia. Many Southeast Asian economy depend so much on China, on China's growth. If something happened between trade war and US and China, somehow it's going to affect the performance of a Southeast Asian economy. But I think the most important question is, this is the way I look at the situation, maybe the tension of the US and China will go beyond trade because this is going to be a sort of like um, competition about the dominance between China, so we have to live with it. Then the question is, even though, you know, the regional integration is not the first best solution, but we have to live with it for quite some time. We have to be very realistic. Unilateral reform, like Bakwati said with the going loan, I don't think will be possible, because the policymaker will say that, why should I open our trade regime if US become protectionist? Multilateral, we pursue, we, we need to pursue to continue, you know, to work, to, to make it work, but probably will take some time. So the only option left available for us is about the regional integration. And the, the question is, what kind of regional integration? To me, the answer is open regionalism in order to sort of like to minimize uh, the impact. So I think on, on that particular issue, we have to be very realistic with the uh, kind of situation as well. I would love to have this multilateralism but the, you know, the, the reality is perhaps we have to wait for quite some time. We have to live with it until this situation you know, can be back to the, the so-called uh, the normal one. On your second question about the short-term and long-term issue, I think the, 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 the answer for this is if we propose something, go beyond the political cycle, it will be very difficult because the politician always asks, why should I jeopardize my political capital if the successor will take the benefit of it? So somehow, we need to combine to provide the so-called, what I call the success story, to gain the political support, then we move to the more complex and difficult reform. Without that, then we always trap between the short term and the long term. Thank you. Bandi. I think if you look at the impact of trade war, on emerging markets. I think there are probably three transmission mechanisms, the, the three channels. First is the direct effect on world trade. Second is the indirect effect on the global supply chain. And the third one is on market confidence, which could lead to you know, disruption. Now, if you look at pre-2008, the world trade growth was about 4 to 5%. It was a happy time. You know, emerging market could grow uh, with that very well. But then after the 2008 crisis, when the major economy ran into difficulties, the banks are not you know, supporting uh, trade transaction. The, the volume of the world trade growth fall from 3 to 4 percent, okay? But now, with the expectation of the prolonged trade friction between the U.S. and China, the figures are now down below 3 percent. If you remember last week, the WTO revised downward this year world trade growth from 2.9 to 2.6%. So I mean, it's really having an impact. So one way is, of course, to try to get the solution you know, back to, to the core to regain 
you know, multilateral uh, trading system. But while we're waiting for that, I think you know, expanding regional trade you know, could be an answer, okay? Uh, just remind me, with the last session, when Mr. Henning mentioned about we are in the transition of one equilibrium to the other equilibrium, I think if we can use intra-regional trade as a, as a driver, that next second equilibrium could be a better one than without the use of intra-regional trade as a driver, okay? So we're still being having effect of the 2.6% growth, but we can continue to support it and make sure that it would not go below uh, 2, 2.5, 2 6 with the help of expanded or enhanced uh, flows of trade uh, by countries in, in the region. That would be my, my answer to your questions. Thank you. Before we move uh, to the final part of the panel, is there any question from the audience on this topic? No? So let me... Sorry, please. I think we have a microphone going around, so that if you can identify yourself. Is there a microphone? It's coming, sorry. Thanks very much, uh, all the presenters. It's uh, wonderful to hear that. I'm Vladimir Sharov from St. Petersburg State University, and I'm also interested in regional integration issues. But my question is another one. It's uh, related to the trade war between the United States and uh, China. What do you think? Uh, maybe it can be regarded not only as a threat, but also as an opportunity for developing countries who are not subject to uh, similar sanctions and who have some uh, trade <laughs> diversion effects, some chances for uh, uh, moving of uh, FDI projects from China to their countries. So maybe it's also an opportunity for developing countries. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think we already discussed a little bit that, but probably we, we can broaden the discussion. It's not just about goods. It is also about technology. It is about infrastructure, Silk Route. I mean, we have so many examples of that. Anyone wants to tackle that question maybe by broadening the perspective beyond pure trade of goods? Well, I think even, let me talk from the, from the Asian experience. I think if you look at the case of Vietnam, yeah, and also Thailand, I do believe that those two countries really take this benefit of this trade tension between China and the U.S. because the relocation of the foreign direct investment and also the increase of the demand for the ready-made garment in Bangladesh. Yeah. So I could see that, I, I completely agree with you, I could see that really an opportunity and potential. Yeah. Not, not only we are looking about the impact of this negative impact of trade, but also the relocation of the investment. A country like Indonesia is also preparing to do some reform in order to take the benefit of it. Please. Well, indeed, one of the implications may be that uh, as the intensity of the north-south trade declines, uh, because of this trade tensions between um, uh, the U.S. and China, uh, the result may be a strengthening of the intensity in the trade across the south-south axis. And if you look at the immediate possibilities with regard to uh, this bilateral friction uh, between the U.S. Um, uh, and China, some of the uh, market segments that uh, may be lost by, say, American producers, this has already been widely discussed in the past several days, may be uh, taken up by uh, countries such as uh, Russia, for example, uh, in terms of uh, LNG or in terms of agricultural goods. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is just one of the dimensions. The other dimension, indeed, as uh, the chair has already indicated, may be simply that as the liberalization impulses uh, get weaker, a different type of integration may be promoted in the world economy, which is connectivity. Connectivity is a different path to economic integration. And just to, to tell you that this is especially important like nowhere else for Eurasia and for countries such as Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked economy in the world. 
If you uh, take other uh, countries in the Eurasian Economic Union, Belarus is the largest landlocked economy in Europe. Uh, four out of five countries in the Eurasian Economic Union are landlocked, which basically, according to all uh, economic estimates, is a severe constraint with regard to uh, economic growth, with regard to trade. How do you counter that? Uh, the, you counter that through connectivity, you counter that through economic integration. Uh, so I think uh, maybe one of the byproducts of what we're seeing could be greater emphasis also in terms of what type of integration we see in the world economy and greater emphasis on connectivity. China is of course is a major force advancing that type of connectivity uh, in Eurasia. Thank you. Let me, let me tackle, I mean, we talk uh, very little about debt and it makes me feel good because I, I'm Italian, we have a massive debt, apparently it's not a big problem, but uh, there is a debate going on not only in the emerging market, but also in developed economies that there has been too much austerity and not enough debt in an era of low, low yield. We heard the point of view of an ex-central banker, we know that they don't like that because ultimately it is a risk which build up and eventually explode down the road. It, is debt a concrete risk for emerging market economy? The classic example is China, and how much debt has been created since the financial crisis to support the economy, a different, or in the end it is manageable. Let me say I'm a Keynesian central banker, so I, I don't <laughs> mind that always. There are some cases in which uh, that can be good. But the, uh, let me, uh, le let me say that uh, perhaps there is a problem uh, of that, but there are many positive dimensions. Uh, le let me mention uh, a, a few. Uh, I mean, in terms of, for example, external debt uh, relative to GDP in Latin America, uh, particularly you take into account reserves, so you have what I, I call net debt, uh, is uh, half of what it used to be in the early 21st century. It's increasing, but it's still very low. Uh, actually, uh, some of the major problems uh, are really, well, I, and there is a, a two positive things uh, in addition to that. The, uh, the, uh, the fact that there are a much larger uh, uh, investment by, by foreign funds uh, into domestic debt, uh, which is uh, something that we didn't know 20 years ago. Yeah. It's really uh, a, an important phenomenon. And, and uh, some of the largest private sector debt that you see, external debt, uh, are associated to the expansion of the, uh, of the, of the large uh, uh, firms uh, which are becoming multi uh, multinationals. So, the, so many are, for example, let's say for uh, example, the, the, say the, the Chilean uh, uh, retail uh, ba uh, business, uh, which is expanding throughout Latin America. Uh, you know, competing with the old, uh, and that's a positive uh, feature. I mean, they have, of course, Chile has a, a, a rising external debt of the private sector, but it's because of the expansion of its firms, uh, which is good. <laughs> uh, so, the, actually, the most important phenomena uh, uh, are probably domestic. I, I, I really think the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the worst case in the world is actually the booming domestic debt in, in China. I mean, but there is nothing like that in Latin America going on. Uh, our major problems, if I may say, are perhaps uh, some sort of contingent liabilities of, uh, of some sort, uh, uh, particularly associated with the pension systems and, and the reform of the pension system. That's a crucial issue everywhere. Absolutely. For the um, sustainability. Yeah. That's a, and of course, it's the major issue for Brazil. Uh, I mean, the big I mean, Brazil has one of the most generous pension systems. But on the other side, for example, the, the, the Chileans did the, uh, the most important uh, pension reform, which basically they handed that to the private sector, uh, pension funds. Now, it's a huge political debate going on in Chile now because the pensions that they pay are too low. <laughs> so, so you have, um, you, know, two, you know, two sides of the, so the pension system is much more important than any, for example, domestic financial issue in Latin America. Uh, in terms of domestic financial crisis, uh, I think we learned very well to manage them uh, in, in general terms. I mean, uh, and that was a, a, it's a legacy of the 1980s, actually. Uh, so the uh, strengthening of financial regulation 
as, as a result of the Latin American debt crisis, it was a significant long-term improvement. I mean, Any final remarks on that? What? Any additional remarks, and then I'm for it. Yes, I, I think we are uh, I, I first of all completely agree, and again to emphasize the issue of contingent liabilities that are multifaceted across emerging markets. Uh, clearly, um, I think another concern that uh, we've seen uh, with regard to emerging markets on this count is that, of course, a lot of the debt, uh, in, including in countries such as uh, China, uh, was coming on the back of economic stimulus. And uh, what you have as a result of the increase in the debt load is greater constraints with regard to the further um, uh, stimulus uh, of the economy in terms of the possibility for fiscal expansion. China was quite active in trying to support growth rates through fiscal means, through monetary means, uh, including through fiscal stimulus. That kind of possibility of coming up with greater growth is then progressively limited because of uh, higher debt. And what that means is that the debt problem necessitates structural reform and new ways to grow in order to uh, overcome the, the, the debt uh, barrier. Thank you. I'm afraid uh, I'm being told the time is up. So let me, let me conclude here. Actually, there, is a, there was still a, a lot to discuss uh, on the points that we raised. But let me say, maybe the best way to conclude is that I, I would like to give you uh, a banker perspective. Uh, uh, the UBS house view is that we are very positive about emerging markets despite everything. And I think the, 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 the important point I want to make, which is very much in line with what we debate, is why we are very positive about that. Some of the topics that we discussed today indeed are the main arguments behind this position. So the first one is that definitely it might well be the protection is coming a time when emerging market already shifted or are shifting towards a different growth model. It's not anymore the export-led model. It is very much domestic consumption. China is a classic example. We should not forget that China current accounts for plus soon will not be anymore what used to be. And so this means that China is moving. And actually the underlying uh, source of growth of many, the leading companies in China very often sell more in the domestic market than outside China. So that's very important. And I think uh, this model is being emulated by over emerging markets. So, and that's one of the reasons. And the regional integration is also part of the story because you tend to sell in your neighbor countries more than eventually exporting uh, into the developed market like the US, which of course remain one of the largest market uh, in the world. The second big driver is the rise of the middle class, something that we haven't really mentioned very much in this debate, but emerging market middle class is growing very fast, while actually the middle class in developed market is shrinking very often. So this for us becomes a very important driver of growth. And the final point, unfortunately we didn't have the time to go a little bit deeper on this, is about disruption and how emerging markets are embracing. Before the move, the, the middle income trap was basically a continuation or an evolution in the economies which took decades. China and other economies are showing that actually you can, uh, I don't like this term very much, leapfrog, but it's very often used. You can embrace technology and use technology to really move from a heavy manufacturing export-led economy to a domestic service economy. And this is something which makes promise well. And then, final remark, which I think pays the ground for the next panel, which is on multilateralism. I think we made a very important point here. Regionalism, domestic market are a very important uh, component of the future strategy of emerging market, but probably is not enough to compensate for a world which eventually will, uh, will, go, will go more protectionist. I, I like very much to conclude this term being floated by the panel, open regionalism might actually be the way forward where different regions with different models from many angles eventually remain connected to a multilateralism which satisfies the different regional needs. With that, let me thank my panelists. I feel a little bit bad to being a little bit in a rush, but I think it was a very interesting debate. Thank you very much. Thank you.